Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church on behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, all of the officers and members of this great church. We're just so blessed that you are sharing with us for our general Sunday School lesson overview. Today's lesson is entitled, A Matter of the Heart. It's taken from the second chapter of Romans, verses 12 through 24 and verses 28 and 29. Our key verse is Romans chapter 2, verse 29. And in the New King James Version, it's written, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Amen. And so in today's lesson, our goal is to examine our assumptions over right and wrong and ensure that we are being guided by the Holy Spirit to make the right decision. Secondly, that we will commit to ensuring God's law is written on our hearts. And third and finally, we will commit to examining our consciences and, and the direction of the Holy Spirit before making life decisions. I believe that this lesson is uh, meant to help us to follow uh, the church's theme this year. Uh, we just last Saturday completed an evangelistic uh, community outreach called Walk the Talk, where we gave away about 350 pairs of shoes to the community. A really wonderful event where we were able to just kind of share the gospel. And the biggest blessing of all was that uh, one of the men from the area, from the community, gave his life to Christ and accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. This community outreach was a direct reflection of our 2023 theme, to be ye uh, doers of the word and not just hearers of the word, to walk the talk. And I believe that this lesson is just a wonderful reinforcement of our 2023 goal that as believers, as teachers, as leaders in the church, as preachers, as ministers of the gospel, we are not just called to know the word and to share the word, but to believe the word and to allow the word to dictate our actions, to guide our hearts, to guide our steps. And so today's lesson is really an encouragement for some and a compass, if you will, for others to make sure that we're pushing ourselves in the right direction as we seek to not only be uh, sharers of God's word, but also doers of God's word. And so we'll begin with prayer and jump right in. If by chance you stumbled upon us for the first time, please be sure to subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications. You'll get all of our content, our 6 p.m. evening Bible classes, our Sunday morning worship services, uh, and then you'll also help us to share this content with as many people as possible. Uh, with the way the YouTube algorithm works, the more likes, the more shares that we get, uh, the more people that we can uh, engage. And it's our goal that not only will believers be encouraged on their own faith journey, but that God will put us in the lives and in the face and the ears of some people that have not yet accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. And we'll continue to plant, we'll continue to water and trust that God will give the increase in their lives. So we'll begin with prayer and then jump right into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to study your word. Father, we confess that we've fallen short, but we thank you for brand new graces and mercies each and every day of our lives. Father, we thank you for an opportunity uh, and the technology that you have given us to continue to study your word, even in the, uh, on the heels of this COVID pandemic. Uh, please empty us out, lift us up higher that we might see you clearer and better understand your word and your will for our lives. Let all that we do be for your glory and your glory alone, and let the love of Christ that saved our souls be reflected in each and everything that we say, do, and think throughout all of our lives. And it is in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And so our lesson is broken down into four different parts, but we'll just uh, recognize that we're now in the book of Romans. Uh, the book of Romans was written by Paul to the church in Rome, a uh, 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 predominantly uh, Jewish or Israelite community or body of believers. And the book of Romans was really meant to explain the theology uh, of salvation through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And so a lot of people recognize the Romans as the, the theology book of the New Testament, where our faith is really uh, broken down and explained on what it means to be a Christian and how we ought to live as a Christian. And then Paul really expounds on that throughout, uh, kind of breaks it down further to each epistle that he writes, rather to individuals or to the different uh, churches throughout Asia Minor region. And so we'll jump right into this lesson. The first part of our lesson is entitled, God's Righteous Judgment Stands for All. Romans 12, or excuse me, Romans 2, verses 12 through 16, and again, all of our scriptures in the New King James Version, the text reads, For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law 
are just in the sight of the God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or else excusing them, in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So our lesson begins with Paul drawing a direct distinction between hearing and obeying the law, that there's a difference, there's a distinction between the two. The old preacher once reminded us in this, our sermon that even the devil knows how to quote scripture, referencing uh, the devil's attempts to uh, tempt Jesus when he was fasting in the mountain. Obviously in the text, Paul is addressing an issue within the church where professed believers are hinging their faith on their knowledge and the memory of the word of God. Too often in ministry, in our lives, and in our faith, and specifically when it comes to worldly matters, we use our education, our titles, and our position, or our prestige to validate ourselves, even sometimes our faith. In the church, if someone can quote scripture, if they can recite all four verses of a popular hymn, if they can use church language during prayers and conversations, and even recite the church covenant through memory, the perception is that individual must be saved and they must take their faith seriously. I can imagine during the time of this epistle when education was not as exalted as it is today and the copies of the Old Testament were uh, rare, it would be quite impressive for someone to display their faith through a recitation of uh, God's word. To be able to quote the Old Testament law would be impressive to say the least. Uh, if someone will be able to uh, comment and expound on Old Testament law, we will walk away thinking that surely that person must be righteous and must be saved. But Paul makes it clear that our salvation or our eternal reward, the glorification that awaits all believers is not predicated on our knowledge or our memory, but rather on our ability to adhere to and be obedient to God's commandments. The concept of deliverance and judgment are presented in this text that we will, we will all be delivered for those of us that are righteous, but regardless on which side of righteousness we stand on, we will all face judgment. With an acknowledgement that God will indeed judge those that are found to be guilty by disobeying the law and pardon those that are found to be not guilty by adhering to the law. There's a deeper and underlying belief here that as righteous believers, our actions are simply a byproduct or a result of our beliefs if we do in fact believe that Jesus died for our sins and we have accepted Jesus Christ as both Lord and Savior, we become followers of Christ. Therefore, regardless of our knowledge of the law or the depth of our understanding of the intricacies of our faith, our actions which are rooted in a belief in Jesus Christ should reflect the principles of God's law. That's to treat others with love the same way that we want to be treated and to love God with all of our heart, minds, and souls. Paul further clarifies that those that don't have the law will be judged and they will perish. Therefore, regardless if we've heard the law, if we memorize the law, if we can quote the law, our actions determine the judgment of God and those actions are a direct reflection of our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ. Paul's words highlight the finality of death and the life of those that don't follow God's word. One day, whether it's from the death whether it's from death in this body or through the return of Christ, all of us that are alive will be judged and we will be sent to one of two places. That's heaven or hell. Those that believe and in this specific case are obedient to God's word through a life that reflects the love of Christ, we will inherit the kingdom of God. Those that fail to be followers of Christ, regardless if they've rejected, disobeyed, or even never heard the gospel, will be judged and will perish for all of eternity. There is no gray area in this declaration. You will either believe and follow and earn, be granted eternal life through a relationship with Jesus, or you will doubt and disobey and you will earn or reap the reward of death. For all of creation, there is only condemnation or justification. We, either, we will either be condemned or we will either be justified. We will either be condemned with this world or justified with Jesus before God for all of eternity. And there is no third option. Paul recognizes that Gentiles, 
Now the Jewish believers that he's talking to will reap the rewards of their actions regardless of their knowledge or the understanding of the law. Biblical ethics uh, propose that when determining right from wrong, outside of actions that are clearly outlined in scripture, we must decide if our actions first bring glory to God and then secondly determine how our actions impact those around us and our community at large. This morality or consensus of what is acceptable and not acceptable can sometimes cause us to question the culture, the laws, and the actions in which our communities follow. And let's make it clear. There are some things that are legal that we know not to be right. Regardless of what the law accepts, regardless of what those that we've elected have told us that we can and can't do, we know as believers that our actions should not just simply follow the Constitution or the laws that govern us, but must reflect the love of God that resides in us, and we must understand how it impacts and affects those that are around us. This clarity that Paul is trying to offer, it, it reinforces the fact that God's law should be written on our hearts and that we should let our hearts or our conscience guide us. As believers, we know that we're just not left to the guidance of our conscience, but that our conscience is guided by God's Holy Spirit that resides in each and every one of us. The moment that we believe we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, which means that God places his spirit inside of each and every one of us. And so we determine or depend on that spirit, God's spirit, for him to be our compass, our guide, to point us and lead us in the right direction. Even non-believers have a sense of right and wrong a knowledge of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Paul makes it clear that God's judgment is not only coming, but that it will show no favoritism. Regardless of our knowledge, regardless of our understanding, and even regardless of our beliefs, all of creation will be judged by God based on our obedience to his word. No one will be excused because they did not know, and no one will gain favor because of knowledge but rather all will be justified or condemned because of faith and obedience alone. And so this first section is really meant to highlight the fact that regardless of how much we know or how we know it, the judgment and the condemnation of God will come directly as a result of our obedience and our faith. And our obedience and faith produces actions that are a reflection of those two things in our life. And so I would dare tell you or share that the way we're acting is a direct reflection of what we believe and how we uh, love God. And if we're uncomfortable with our actions, if we're uncomfortable with the way we live, we should re-examine our faith and our obedience and righteousness before the Lord because those are the things that produce the actions in our lives. So the first part of our lesson is God's righteous judgment stands for all. The second part of our le lesson is religious privilege is refuted. So Romans chapter 2, verses 17 through 20 reads, Indeed, you are called a Jew, and rest on the law, and make your boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. So Paul, in verses 17 through 20, highlights the pride that Jewish believers having their knowledge and understanding of the law. As the church continued to grow and more Gentiles became members of the church, there was a, uh, a large schism between those that understood Old Testament law that were introduced to it and those that didn't, those that were circumcised and those that weren't, those that had practiced and understood the, four, uh, the, the yearly feasts and the yearly uh, festivals and the uh, sacrificial system and those that didn't. And especially for Jewish believers as the church began to grow, specifically in the Rome region where you had this influx of non-Jews, of Gentile believers that were professing a belief in Christ, the Jewish believers kind of held themselves above or thought that they were almost better than because they knew Old Testament law. Again, at the time of this, of this epistle, there was only a word of mouth sharing of the Gospels. And so the stories of Jesus Christ had not yet been written. Uh, the four Gospels had not yet been produced. And the word of God was being delivered through word of mouth. And so there was either 
a sharing of what people had actually eyewitnessed or heard about Jesus Christ, or there was a resuscitation of the Old Testament law that was a pointing towards the coming of Christ. And so the only written word of God that was available was Old Testament word uh, prophecy and Old Testament books, which were written in Hebrew, which only Jewish believers could read if they could read at all. And these Gentiles kind of felt uh, underqualified, if you will, as if they were missing out on something. And we'll see that if we look through the book of uh, Ephesians, Philippians, as Paul has to address some of these issues with these Gentile churches and their feeling of being inadequate because they don't have a true understanding of Old Testament law. But uh, Paul, Paul kind of confronts this belief by these Jewish believers that they're better than others because they have this fuller understanding of what the Old Testament law presented. Even though some would call the dark this, this period, the dark ages of Christianity, by this period I mean the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament, known as the intertestamental period, the 400 years of silence from God amongst his uh, chosen people, uh, Israelites continued to believe that they were God's chosen people, that they were called to live a life separated and above uh, what the world would consider regular or normative. So the Israelites hung their faith on their knowledge and understanding and adherence to God's law. If you knew the law and could recite the law and adhere to the law, then you must be saved. You must be righteous. Paul lists the things that Jews would not only be proud of, but would consider a badge of honor. To know God's will, to have an understanding of the law, to be able to direct those that are ignorant of the law. And he specifically said to be a guide to the blind, a light in the darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of babes. His goal, or Paul's goal, is to show that the law is not meant just to justify, but to guide. Simply having, knowing, and even understanding the law is not good enough. Even if we are able to articulate God's word, to teach God's word, and memorize God's word, it's not good enough. We must be doers and not just hearers of God's word. Our justification comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ, and a true relationship with Christ produces Christ-like actions in the life of us as followers of Christ. If that relationship is legit, if it's real, it will produce a change on the inside of each and every one of us that will produce external actions. The way we act is a direct reflection on what we believe. We can know the word of God forwards and backwards, but if our actions don't reflect that knowledge, then we are simply actors in a play, regurgitating lines that we have memorized for the show. So we looked at God's righteous judgment stands for all. We just covered religious privilege is refuted. Now our third portion of this lesson is a heart in the right place. Romans chapter 2 verses 21 through 24 reads, You therefore who teach one another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through the breaking of the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. So Paul then uses this series of questions to convict his audience by revealing the hypocrisy that lies in the lives of one who teaches the law but fails to follow the law in our own lives. During a police community meeting, officers asked community leaders how they could help repair the fractured relationship between police and citizens. A pastor responded that it would help if the police followed the laws themselves and weren't so callous in their own obedience. He went on to share that when officers run red lights, when they drive while talking on their cell phones, when they fail to put their seatbelts on, and when they break what some would consider minor, minor traffic laws, it tells the community that police only enforce the laws, but they don't adhere to the laws themselves. A similar situation, a defendant in traffic court attempted to beat a traffic ticket by showing video evidence that the officer that pulled him over and wrote the ticket broke the very same law themselves. While the judge appeared to be sympathetic to the defendant, she eventually ruled against the defendant, but in her ruling admonished the officer by sharing that the officer should have wrote himself a ticket because he can't expect others to follow laws that he won't follow himself. Both of these examples highlight the, church, the struggle that the church now faces when we have leaders, teachers, and preachers who can effectively proclaim 
who can dutifully teach, who can greatly share and preach the gospel, but at the same time fail to practice and follow the gospel in our own lives. The old preacher will remind his congregation at the end of each service to be careful how they were living because there is a chance that those members might be the only Bible their friends, neighbor, and family members see all week. It was a constant reminder that most of the world that does not yet believe in Jesus Christ is not picking up a Bible and reading it every day. And their only exposure to the love of God and the word of God is through the actions of those that believe and follow Jesus Christ. And so in 2023, now more than ever, we have to accept the fact that even in or outside the church, we are all being watched through social media, through the internet, through the globalization of the world. There really is no more privacy in this world in which we live. From our internet activity to even the shows we watch, tracking has evolved to a point where people can find out pretty much anything they want about us with just a few clits of a mouse. The other day we were talking about an older preacher and we couldn't agree on how old the preacher was. We simply put in his name and his city and we were able to come up with his entire history, his background, every home that he's ever lived in, his cell phone number, and then they offered an opportunity for us to pay $7.99 to even find out more information. We are exposed. And that word exposed tends to draw up negative connotations, that someone has revealed what was intended to be hidden. However, as Christians and believers, we understand that what happens in the dark will eventually come to the light that we will always be exposed. And so it's up to us to decide when the curtain is pulled back, when the light switch is turned on, what will people see? Uh, my mother and father, when they first started stopping by the house, they would always call first. And they would say, uh, we're, we're outside, we just want to give you a heads up. And I would say, you didn't have to call, I knew you were coming, just ring the doorbell. They would say, oh, we didn't know if you all need to straighten up if you need to put some clothes on, if you need to get the house together. And I was like, Mom, Dad, I always have clothes on. The house is always together. We, we, we keep the house clean. There's no need to straighten up. And I respect what they were doing. They were attempting to give us privacy. But it was under the general assumption that when people are coming over, we normally have to prepare and get things together. The Bible makes it clear. When Jesus comes back, there will not be time for preparation. There's one of my favorite parables is the 10 bridesmaids. Five had oil in their lamps and five did not. And when the bridegroom came for the wedding march, the five that did not have oil went to go fill their lamps and they missed out. The other five entered into the wedding feast. The doors were closed and all that were locked out were not permitted to enter. It's a direct uh, parable that reflects what will happen on judgment day. That God is sending his son, Jesus Christ, to return. And those of us that will believe will be raptured immediately into heaven. Those that don't believe will be cast into the pit of fire. There's no in-between. There's no preparation. You can't say, give me five minutes. You can't say, I'm getting out the shower. Let me throw some clothes on. You're either ready or you're not. Regardless of the circumstances, we must understand that people are watching us and people expect us to be able to practice what we preach. When I go to the gym and I'm looking for a trainer, I want my trainer to be in good shape themselves. If you're not practicing what you preach, I doubt that you're able to help me. I'm probably wrong because I'm sure that there are some trainers that are not in the best shape themselves that can be very effective trainers. But visually, if you don't look like you're listening to yourself, what am I going to listen to you for in my own life? In the same vein, uh, a financial consultant, if you're not financially independent yourself, why would I depend on you to give me financial direction in my life? You can't teach me how to barbecue if you're burning all the meat on your grill. In the exact same vein, believers, especially those that have been blessed with opportunities to lead, to teach, and to preach, must be sure to let our actions and our beliefs guide our proclamation. That we're doing what we're saying. God is not looking for someone that has the best memory or the best voice or that can put the best presentation together. 
Our national president, Dr. Jerry Young, said last year in one of our meetings that he knows some very good preachers that aren't very good preachers. In other words, our abilities should never outshine our living. Dr. Matt King Carter once said that we can't preach above our living, which means that we can't preach about a lifestyle and our obedience to God without it being reflected in our own lives. We have to be doers of the word and not just hearers, or in this case, proclaimers of the word. Paul concludes this portion of our lesson by sharing that this is the reason why people blaspheme God. The reason why church attendance is down, the reason why faith and belief in God is on a downward trend in America is not because God has changed or because God has failed, but the decline of the church in the modern times is a direct reflection of the people of God failing to practice what we preach. I don't know many people that have left the church because God has let them down. Most people that leave the church is because someone upset them, someone did something that they shouldn't have done, a leader that was lifted up came crashing down. And so we must recognize that it's not God or the word of God that's pushing believers away or detracting non-believers from coming towards the light, but it's the actions of the people in the church. And until we get our act together, until we stop just being hearers and proclaimers of the word and become doers of the word, we'll continue to push people away because we present ourselves as a house of hypocrites. So we see God's righteous judgment stands for all. We see religious privileges refuted, and we see a heart in the right place. But the last and the fourth portion of our lesson is entitled, Will the Real Israelites Stand Up? Romans chapter 2, verses 28 through 29 reads, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter whose praise is not from men, but from God. So Paul ends our lesson by redefining what it means to be a Jew to this Christian community in Rome. Paul says that our faith is not external, but rather internal. As God's favorite nation, Jews longed to return to the days where they received the blessings of God. They regularly inherited the provisions, the land, the victories, and the exalting of the Lord. These were benefits that all Jews inherited simply through birth. However, Paul makes it clear that the circumcision that marks men as members of the Abrahamic faith should be of the heart and not simply of the flesh. These Jews believe that their adherence to the law and their obedience to God's word would grant them or earn them eternal life. But Paul says that the actions are not good enough on their own. To know the law and even practice the law as presented is, is, is empty if our hearts and our attitudes don't align with what we proclaim to believe. Even if we do the right thing with the wrong intention, we are still living outside the will of God. Obeying the letter of the law, doing exactly what is on the paper simply isn't good enough unless our hearts and our spirits are aligned with God. I'll close with an example of a cooking show that I was watching just the other day. There was a home chef competing against a culinary trained chef. The trained chef followed the recipe to the letter. They plated the dish beautifully and was able to articulate each part of the dish. The home plates, the home chef's plate did not look well at all. The food was kind of sloppy and it wasn't cut well. The home chef even admitted that they didn't even measure, but they eyeballed the ingredients. Even though the trained chef did exactly what was on the recipe, all the judges commented that there was something missing from the dish. The home chef received hard critiques on their appearance, but the judges all said that their food tasted like Sunday dinner at mom's house and the home chef won the competition. As believers, we should do all that we can to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit and learn God's word. In 2023, there is really no excuse to not be educated as a Christian. With access to seemingly unlimited resources through YouTube, through Google, through Facebook, Uh, through uh, places like Blue Note Bible and uh, Enduring Word. There's just so many free resources that help us to better understand the Word of God. However, regardless of our level of education, of our level of aptitude and knowledge, if we are actors, if we do what we understand and what God has showed us and what the Holy Spirit guides us to do, Our living will be the best sermon, 
the best lesson, or the best song that we can ever present. Don't be discouraged in our own lives because our presentation isn't as good as someone else's. Don't be discouraged because we can't quote or sing or hoop like someone else. I, I have been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ since December 31st, 2006. One of the biggest, the greatest privileges and honors in my life is to be a preacher, to be called by God to proclaim his word. And I don't think that I'm a bad preacher. But I've heard some preachers that I know in my heart are better than me. Good preachers. They can quote scripture. They can just come flat out do it. And if I'm honest with myself, I would much rather hear some of my favorite preachers preach. than my, I, I love to hear our pastor, Dr. Backus, preach. If you're listening and haven't listened to one of our 11 a.m. worship services, just chime in one time. Dr. Backus a truly gifted man of God that preaches in such a conversation style that can deliver the word in a way that just brings clarity. I love to hear Frank Ray quote scripture and just make it live. I love to hear uh, our pastor's son, Pastor Reginald L. Back is in Brooklyn, New York. His belief in the impossible and his power of Jesus to perform miracles even today is, is second to none. I love to hear one of my good friends, Cliff Mays, it just can bring the scripture to life like never before. Uh, the moderator of Greater New Era District here in Chicago, Jarvis Hansen, younger than me, not even 40 yet, but has just an old spirit and can hoop like something you can't believe. I love to hear those guys preach, but I'm not ashamed of the gift that God has given me because I can't do what they can do. Don't be discouraged when our abilities don't stack up to those that are the, the, those that are our peers or our co-workers in his faith. Because thank God it's not that on our ability that souls are saved. It's not based on how good I preach or, or if I hit the right notes when I'm singing or how many scriptures I can memorize. It's the love of God that I can share. And so it's my prayer that when I'm preaching, when I'm teaching, when I'm sharing the gospel, that God's love protrudes out of me. Even when I'm not in an official capacity, when I'm on the bus, when I'm in my car, when I'm at the gas station, when I'm at a restaurant, I should allow God's love through the guidance of the Holy Spirit to just radiate where people can't help but feel it, where people must see something in me, they come running and asking what must they do to be saved. All we have to do is live a life of righteousness. All we have to do is keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and align our hearts with him, love our neighbors and our God, and make sure that all we do, that we have something on the inside, and that's the love of Christ that just pushes and guides and directs all of our actions. If every look, every thought, every word, every action is covered in the love of God, Regardless of our ability and our aptitude, God has use for us, and we can be a part of his plan to change the lives of the people around us. We just can't be hearers of the word. And in this lesson, we just can't be proclaimers of the word, but we must also be doers of the word, that everything that we preach, everything that we teach, everything that we understand and take in, that it comes right back out. Uh, I know I said I was finished, but I'll give you one more example. And I've shared this before a few years back. Uh, a sponge is a very simple tool. Uh, you use it to soak up material. So what a sponge can do is soak up water. If you spill something, it can soak it up. However, when a sponge is squeezed, it releases what it's already soaked up. And so as believers... The truth is all of us are squeezed most of the time on a daily basis. Our bosses squeeze us, our wives and husbands squeeze us, our children squeeze us, our financial concerns squeeze us, our health concerns squeeze us, the fears of this world squeeze us, the troubles of our life squeeze us, our own shortcomings and limitations squeeze us. But when we're squeezed, the only thing that can come out is what we've soaked in. And so if we want to be doers of the word, we need to saturate our lives with God's word through prayer, through Bible study, through meditation, through fellowship with God. And then when we are squeezed, when life puts its hands around us and its grip tightens around our necks, 
We don't have to be discouraged. We don't have to be fearful. We don't have to run and hide. We don't have to incubate ourselves in our fears. But whether we can depend on God's word, knowing that what we have soaked up will come out in those tight moments. And so the way that we become doers of the word and not simply hearers or proclaimers of the word is by making sure that we have a healthy and almost greedy intake of God's word. I want as much as I can get. That way when difficult times come, and they're coming, if they're not already here in your life, you know exactly who to depend on, where to fall back to. That's God's word, the love of God that changed our life, that took us from darkness into his marvelous light. What a wonderful word, what a wonderful lesson. And I know this lesson has been an encouragement to me, not nothing I didn't know, but something that I needed to hear to be a reminder. It's not just good enough, and, and I'm a perfectionist. I like to make sure that I've got my lessons together. I like to make sure that I'm doing my homework. I like to make sure that I'm knowledgeable about what I'm sharing. But as much emphasis and effort I put into my knowledge, I need to put even more emphasis uh, on my faith, on my obedience, on my righteousness, on my living, that I'm not just a proclaimer or hearer of God's word, but that I become a doer of God's word. Amen. As always, we thank you for worshiping with us in your study. Uh, we encourage you to also join us in worshiping in your giving. We have four ways for you to support the work here at Friendship Baptist Church. You can give on Cash App, Dollar Sign Friendship Chicago. You can give on our website, www.fbcchicago.org. You can text the word GIVE to 773-992-1462. Or as always, you can mail your check or money order to the church, Friendship Baptist Church, Care of Dr. Reginald E. Back is 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. For those of you all that have supported or are considering supporting this ministry, we definitely praise God for your sacrifice and for your love offering. And we guarantee that God not only will replenish you, but I will bless your gift so that we can continue to do the work that he's called us to do. Uh, regardless if you give here, uh, we just encourage you to support some ministry where we can continue to spread the gospel and continue to do the work uh, that God has called us to do as believers. Uh, that's lights to be lights in the midst of darkness. Uh, secondly, if you're not a member of a church, we would love for you to be a member with us here at Friendship. Because of this COVID pandemic, we have been able to reach so many different people uh, all over this world. And so if you would like to join us here, just leave a message in the chat. Give us a phone call, shoot us an email. Or if you want us to help you find a place in your local area where you will be comfortable growing and an understanding of God's word and in your faith, just let us know and we'll be happy to partner with you and help you find a place where you will be comfortable uh, growing in, in your own faith journey. Uh, as always, we encourage you to join us each Tuesday morning at 8 a.m. Uh, we have uh, prayer. Uh, led by our senior associate, Reverend Aaron Davidson. We call out the name of each and every person on our sick and shut-in list. We invite you to be a, call, a part of that. Each Tuesday evening at 7 p.m., our brotherhood, our layman meet, uh, under the direction of one of our deacons, Deacon Lucas. Uh, they have a Bible study and man talk, and they do service acts throughout the year. And then on the fourth Tuesday of each month, our Women of Faith meet, led by our, our First Lady Sister Detra Bacchus, where they have a Bible study, and they're currently gearing up for our angel tree in which we are a blessing to so many children of incarcerated parents throughout our community. And then finally, we encourage you to join us each morning at 11 a.m. for our live worship service where you hear some of the best preaching this side of heaven. If you would like a more traditional uh, Sunday school class, all of our classes are meeting either through conference call or Zoom. Reach out to the church. We'll help you find a class that can help meet your needs, and you can have a more interactive lesson, a classroom setting where you'll be with other students and can ask questions and get feedback on your own thoughts about the Word of God. Other than that, we praise God for each and every one of you. We thank you for worshiping with us in this uh, Sunday School Lesson Overview, and we pray that if God says the same, we'll see you next Sunday, same time, same channel for more Sunday School Lesson Overview. Let's dismiss in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to study your word. Father, we thank you that in the midst of difficult circumstances that you've given us your Holy Spirit to guide us to not do our own thing, but to follow your word and live a life of righteousness, to be able to present it before you faultless through a relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, help us to recognize the sacrifice of your son. Help us to allow that sacrifice to dictate and guide our actions and our heart. Help us to depend on your Holy Spirit so that we might do what is acceptable in your sight. Father, help us to understand that we should not just be doers, I mean, should not be hearers and proclaimers of your word, but we should be doers of your word. 
that all that we have come to proclaim that we believe, know, and accept is true, that it will reflect in our actions and the way that we treat and love on other people. It is in your son Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. We'll see you in just a few moments in our live worship service. And may God continue to bless and keep each and every one of you.